Okay, so this 2-2 this two -two is about histograms, frequency polygons, and it's pronounced ogives. It's pronounced like a J, not a G. I can't explain why. I don't know the reason. All right? But that's what 2-2 two -two is all about. And the reality is 2-2 two -two is all about graphical <coughs> representations of frequency distributions and cumulative frequency distributions. So everything we did in 2-1 will be applied to a graph in 2-2, two -two, okay? That's the key thing here. And again, none of it's hard. You just have to keep it straight when you use boundaries, when you use midpoints, when you make bar graphs, when you make line graphs, that kind of thing. And then I'm going to go through all that with you right now, okay? So first off, here's what a histogram is. And you've probably dealt with histograms before. It is a vertical bar graph that displays the information contained in a frequency distribution. It's a bar graph of a frequency distribution. And the way that we create a histogram has some specific criteria that we use. Okay, so make sure you pay attention to this and follow this so that when we do this, you do it correctly. Histogram, we use class boundaries, not class limits. And I'll explain why in a second. So that column in your frequency distribution that you didn't use for anything in 2.1, we're now going to use for a couple different things in 2.2. Now for the, for the histogram, for the frequency polygon, for the ogive, I'm going to use the same data that we looked at in 2.1. Okay, so, so I'm going to put up here part of that data that, that you've already seen in the 2.1 video. So if you want to take a picture of this and add it to your notes, if you want to grab it from your 2-1 notes, if you have it in your pictures, however you want to get it into your notes, into your notes. But this is the exact same data that we used in 2-1. Obviously, I cut off the class limits part. We just have the boundaries and the frequency because we're going to use this to build our histogram. In fact, um, you can take a picture of this page. It would probably be better. Um, where you've got the graph the x-axis containing the boundaries, okay? The frequency is on the y-axis, and we're gonna construct that histogram in a second. Now, there's, there's a couple reasons why we use the boundaries. When we create a histogram, the bars should actually touch each other, okay? And the reason that that happens, the reason that we use the boundaries to make that happen is we have overlap, right? This first row ends at 104.5, the second one starts at 104.5. So that's why there's not going to be overlap from this bar, or, or that's why this bar is going to touch with that bar, okay, and etc. So I'm going to have a bar for each row. And the other reason, the other reason I want to go through this with you is in case you didn't know, um, the latest notability allows you to draw perfect shapes. Did you know that? Yes. Okay, so if you draw, uh, you know, remember in the past, if you drew, you're trying to draw a straight line and you just held it down, it would force it into be a perfectly straight line, it will recognize if you try to draw a rectangle and you hold your stylus or finger down, it will automatically turn into a rectangle or a triangle or a circle or an over, that kind of thing. So I want you to practice that a little bit today as we work through it. Um, the other thing that we've discovered is the best way to draw on a picture is to use the magnifying glass. That's, that seems to be the best thing. I, apparently it doesn't work with stars. Okay, so I know it works with uh, rectangles, quadrilaterals, uh, uh, pentagons. I don't know that we've tried anything. I haven't tried anything else. Anyway, let's talk about how to draw this first one, okay? So how high up should the first bar go from 99.5 to 104.5? It should go up 2. The frequency is 2. So my first bar should look something like that, okay? Okay. Um, using the scale that we have on the left. All right. How high up will the next bar from 104.5 to 109.5 go? Eight. It'll go up 8, right? Now, I chose to use a different color. You don't have to use a different color. You don't even have to fill it in. But some of you like to be creative with some of that stuff, so feel free. Uh, finish the histogram. Take a look at your screen. You should have something like this. Okay, raise your hand if you have something like that, okay? Again, not hard, takes a little time. 
Um, you will need to be able to do this in your homework and for your quiz on Monday, okay? Any questions about how to make a histogram? Notice the bars all touch. There's no space in between them. There's uniformity in the width of the bars. That's important. The next thing is a frequency polygon. Again, we're going to use the same data. And now we, we talked in 2.1, you had to find points. So uh, I, you had to find midpoints in 2.1, and we're going to use those uh, for the frequency polygon. The key thing here is remembering that it's a polygon, which is a shape. So inevitably, what needs to happen is your graph should end up looking like a shape, and, and I'm going to show you how to do that. First off, let's start with uh, a definition. It's a line graph displaying the information displayed in a frequency distribution. Again, it's, it's the data in the frequency distribution. But we're going to use the midpoints. Okay. Um, so same data as we've been dealing with. Okay. Class boundaries still, frequency, this is the same data. But now I want you to find the midpoints. Okay. And to find the midpoints, how do, how do we find the midpoint? Four Add together and divide by two. Add the lower boundary plus the upper boundary, divide by two, that's going to be your midpoint. Okay, and then you can probably find the first one and the second one and then figure out there's going to be a pattern and then come up with the rest of them. So I want you to do that. Find those midpoints. What, what is the first one? First midpoint. 104.5 plus 99.5 divided by two. Which is what? 102. Very good. You could have also, well, I mean, because what, what are the class limits that go with these boundaries? What's this one? 100 to 104. Right? That might be an easier way to find the midpoints. So what's the midpoint for this one? This is 105 to 109. What's the midpoint? 107. What's it going to go up by? Five. It's going to go up by five. What's the class width? Five. Five. That's how it's supposed to work. When you know the class width and you find the first midpoint, you can really just add the class width to each one. So go ahead and finish that table. Here are the midpoints. This is what you should have had. Now, we're going to take these midpoints. The midpoints are not going to be the x-axis. Okay, the frequency is still going to be the y-axis. So, um... Here's what this looks like. I just scrunched the little table down so it's all on the same screen. Take a picture of this, of this uh, screen, please. Again, so the bottom, here are the midpoints. This is the frequency. Okay. Now, I want to point something out, too. Notice here that there's sort of these two random points down here. They, they are not from the table. They are literally random points on the x-axis. Okay, and the reason that they are there is to help close the polygon. And when I and and I'll explain what that means here in a second. But your first point of your frequency polygon should always be on the x-axis, in between the y-axis and the first value, somewhere in here. Okay, try to space it out about right, but it doesn't matter if it's not perfect but it should be somewhere in here. And then try to space this endpoint somewhere out here too. Okay, Not too far, not too close. Try to keep your spacing the same. And I'll explain what those points are and why they're there in a second. Okay. So what we do next is we take the midpoint and the frequency and we turn it into a point. So I'm going to graph the point 102, 2. Okay. So my first point is going to be somewhere in here. Okay, 102, 2. Then my next one is what? 107, 8. And then so forth. So do that. Put your points up there. Graph, graph those all as points. What your points kind of look like, all right? Now, what you need to do next is actually connect the dots, okay? Now, here's why. If, if you didn't connect those points that are on the bottom, you'd have something that looks like this. And I'm going to draw it. It's not going to look great, but... Um, give it a shot because this happens it, it doesn't it doesn't let me I don't have a good enough stylus to get it perfect 
like you guys have can zoom in I can't do that on this program but let's say I want to I want to I'm gonna do it without connecting those two points at the bottom for a second okay and the reason I'm doing that is this is just a line graph okay it's a line floating in space so to speak all right the reason that we put those two extra points one at the beginning and one at the end is to close it into a polygon where the x-axis, oops, the x-axis acts as the sort of bottom of the polygon. So it's now a closed shape, right? And it's now a polygon. It, and that's the key. It's not a line graph. You're not making a line graph. You're making a frequency polygon. So it's really important to have those two points at the bottom, one before the first midpoint and one after the last midpoint, so that that x-axis can close it up into a polygon, okay? And so final should look like that, so that it's closed at the bottom. You don't have to fill it in. Uh, you can fill it in. You don't have to outline the whole thing, but it's clear that it's now closed because of the x-axis. And that's the distinction I want to make because on your quiz, on your homework, some of you will forget those two points, and those two points at the beginning at the end are what close it, okay? Questions about that? Again, nothing about this is hard. It takes a little time. And you have to know that you use the midpoints. All right. The next thing that we're going to look at is called an ogive. Okay. And an ogive is another visual representation of some data, but it's specifically a cumulative frequency graph. It is a graph of the cumulative frequency. So every time in 2-1 that you are making a cumulative frequency graph, or table distribution, we're gonna use that for our ogives. Again, we're gonna use the same data that we've been using. Okay, so here is the start of our cumulative frequency graph for that particular set of data. Again, I use boundaries. Whenever you use cumulative frequency graph, we use the boundaries. So I start with the smallest boundary, work my way up to the highest boundary, okay? So what was, what is the first cumulative frequency going to be? How many data values are there less than 99.5? Zero. zero. There's, this one's always zero. Okay. Then how many are less than 104.5? Two. Two. Okay. And then you just start adding them up, right? Because under 109.5, so between 104.5 and 109.5, there's how many? Eight. Eight. And then there's two less than that. So everything less than 109.5 is 10. Okay. So now you just keep adding up as you go. So finish that table. When you're done, take a look at the screen. Make sure you have your cumulative frequency table or your cumulative frequency distribution done correctly. Ultimately, the last line should always be the total number of data values because you add up along the way and include all of them. First one should always be zero. The last one should always be the grand total. So we're going to do a similar, the ogive is a similar thing to the frequency polygon in terms of it being a line graph. Now my x-axis is going to be all those boundaries. My y-axis is going to be the cumulative frequency. So you're going to make a bunch of points, connect the dots, and you're going to have a line graph, okay? So, again, small little table to the left. It's the same one that was on the other screen. On the right, you have the one where you're going to create it. Um, I chose to use one that goes by fives, okay? Notice the boundaries on the bottom are the x-axis. The y-axis are the cumulative frequency. So uh, the first one is always going to be at zero, 99.5 and zero. So I'm going to have a point right there on the x-axis. And then you just keep building them. 104.5 is going to be 2, and go from there. So go ahead and, and finish that, and then connect the dots and make your line graph, and that's an ogive. Okay, so go ahead and do that. Let me say that again. It is a line graph. It does not connect back down to the x-axis like the polygons. It's going to be a floating line in midair, so to speak. Connected to the x-axis at the very first point, but it will just climb from there. And all ogives do that to some extent. Here's what your point look like, okay, something like this, okay, something very close to that. 
and then you just connect the dots. That's no jive, okay? Um, notice what you want to look for. Eventually, you're going to use these to make some analysis. You want to look for big jumps, right? It's clear that in here, the temperature rises quite a bit over the states in this particular study, all right? And then it kind of flattens out again. But that's where you, some big changes are going on or the bulk of the data is, right? Because it's all about frequency. So most of the data is in there where the jumps are made. Okay. All right, we've got a few more things to do. The other thing that you can use instead of frequency or cumulative frequency is something called relative frequency. Okay, and relative frequency is defined by this. RF for relative frequency is the class frequency, so the individual row frequency divided by the total sum of the frequencies. Okay, another way to think about this is proportional. Right? So it's percentage, proportional of the whole, something that you can do um, to compare one particular class to another. And essentially, you, would, you could use relative frequency to replace the frequency column. Or, in some cases, you can add an additional column entitled relative frequency to your distribution. And use that as a ways of comparison as well. So here's that distribution. Just adding the relative frequency column. It's the same table that we've been working with. Same data we've been working with. Yeah, take a picture of that because you're going to find the rest of the relative frequencies. So all, we, all you do here is we know that there are 50 states. There's 50 data values in total here. You take each individual frequency and divide it by the total, and this gives me my relative frequency. You could leave it as a decimal. You could, leave it as, you could turn it into a percent. I don't care. All right? But what you want to do now is convert all of these into relative frequency. Take each of them and divide by 50. An easy way to do that, since it's something over 50, I can multiply the bottom by 2, multiply the top by 2, right? Then it'd be something over 100. So in this case, it's 4. Move the decimal place over two places. So what's the, what's the next one going to be? <coughs> 0 0.16. So multiply that by 2, move the decimal over, okay? So 0 0.16. And you just keep going down. So do that. So yeah, you divide by the total number of data values. In this case, in this problem, it's 50 states, so there's 50 different numbers. So if there was a different set of data, you divide by whatever total number of data points there are in that. Okay. So knowing that I've used up all the frequencies and divided them all by the total, what should the sum of the relative frequencies be? 100. One. 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 Yeah, 100% or 1. So what should happen every time is after you do these calculations, it should add up to 1. Now, that being said, sometimes it might be a little more than 1 or a little less than 1, depending on how far you rounded, right? Sometimes um, you might get 0.99 instead of 1 just because of rounding, right? If you get a bunch of ones that are like, if that would have turned out, instead of being uh, 0.36, it was actually 0.364. And then you had another one that was... Um, you know, 0.264, it's probably going to be less than 1 in that case. It just depends on how far you round. That, that would be the only reason why it wouldn't ever add up to 1, is that it's just based on rounding. So if you round it out further, if you went had more decimal places, it would get closer to 1. Okay. Now, this frequency column can also be used in place of the frequency column to create a histogram, to create a frequency polygon to create an ogive, okay? And that's what this says on at the bottom. If I just replaced the last column, or and not even replaced, but if I, if I chose to use this column instead and use that as my y-axis, I could create all those other graphical displays. Okay? And sometimes you'll be asked to do that um, and just know that you can and, and there's... You should have actually similar type shape as what you would have had if you had a frequency 
instead of relative frequency. Okay, we have two more things, two more slides that you're going to have to take pictures of that we need to talk about. Okay. Yeah, no, I'm waiting. Uh, they are going to be uh, descriptions of the shape of a histogram. And they have certain qualities and names that we're going to use, and I'll put those up here in a sec. First four of distribution shapes. Take a picture of this. They all have names. I'm going to talk about them and why they are called what they are called. These ones are fairly straightforward. It's the next four that are a little trickier. So most of these are pretty obvious. Okay. Uh, this is bell shaped because it kind of looks like a bell. It doesn't have to be perfectly bell shaped. We will get, we will talk about perfectly bell shaped graphs and curves later in this course, but it has to have that bell kind of shape. Uniform, meaning the peaks are basically in the same spot. Okay. Obviously, they're not in the same spot, but they're really close. Okay, so that would be a uniform. The J shape, they say, kind of looks like a J. It's pretty, it's, it's a stretch, okay? Obviously, because of the fact that I also, let's just get rid of that. There we go. Supposedly looks kind of like a J. The key thing is it, there's, there's a progression up from the left, down from the right, whichever way you want to look at it. And then, of course, the reverse J is... The J in reverse. Wouldn't this be an L? An L? No, it's a curve. An L is not a curve. An L is very clear 90 degrees. It's a uniform. Okay. All right. Anyway, that's the best explanation I got for those four. Next four. This is where it gets a little trickier. The top two I'm going to save for last. The bottom two I'm going to talk about first. Okay. So the bimodal is basically where there are two peaks, okay? It has to drop back down in the middle, and then it also has to drop back down slightly on the other side. If you wanna call it two peaks, you wanna call it a camel with two humps, you wanna call it an M, I don't care, okay? But it has to come back down on the other side, and that's the distinction that is made between the bimodal and the U-shape, okay? The U-shape kind of also has two peaks as well, right? On, on the left and then the right, except it doesn't drop down on the other side, right? So it's just sort of this part of the bimodal. So that's how you keep those two straight. Yeah, they have two peaks, but it doesn't come back down on the other side, and that's what makes it a U. If it comes back down on the other side of those peaks, then it's bimodal, okay? The right skewed and the left skewed, Here's the way you have to think about this, okay? Because intuitively, for me, it's backwards, so I have to trick myself, all right? When less of the data is to the right, it is right skewed. So less of the data is over here, it's higher on the left side. Less of the data is on the right, it is right skewed. Less of the data is on the left, it is left skewed. For me, intuitively, this feels backwards. And that's what I have to remind myself. So every time I'm trying to decide if it's right skewed or left skewed, I have to really think about this. Because to me, right skewed should mean there's more of the data to the right. But it's not. More of the data is to the left in a right skewed distribution. More of the data is to the right in a left skewed distribution. So to me, intuitively, it's a little backwards. If you just want to think about it as where less of the data is, less of the data is to the right, less of the data is to the left. We're going to talk more about right and left skewed later on this course, but those are going to come into play, okay? I like that. That's, I, that was good. That was a good, good analogy. So instead of, well done, Jonathan, I like that. How about in saying right skewed, it was right skied, right? You ski to the right. Ooh, I like that. That's good. Right skied. Now, skewed, don't write skied on your test. Don't write it on, don't write it on your quiz. But if you ski to the right, ski to the left, that's another way I like it. Whatever works. I don't care how you, I don't care what trick you use to keep it straight. Just come up with a trick that works for you. Okay?